We have a bulletin just received. I've never encountered anything like this world. Keyframe animation in After Effects. Adobe After Effects is used in many professional capacities. It is a deep application with many features and functions. You can go to adobe.com to view additional tutorials on Adobe After Effects. In this video, we'll learn to use keyframe animation to create moving images using materials created in Photoshop. Like all of the applications in the Adobe Creative Cloud, Photoshop and After Effects work really well together. We'll also learn how to export our video in QuickTime format so we can import it into Apple's GarageBand and add sound. Make a folder, put everything in it. If you only pay attention to one thing in this video, it should be this, because if you don't pay attention to it, and you do it wrong, it'll really mess you up. Make a new folder and put everything in it before you import it into your After Effects file. Also, save your After Effects file into this folder as well. So go to File, New Folder. Here's the new folder. And I'll call it My Name Scott Lagan Animation so there can be no confusion about what it is. And here's all the online exercise files. You guys will have access to all these files as well. And I'm just going to drag this entire folder into my animation folder. So it's important to do that before you import the images into After Effects. In order to keep file size small and make you able to work with your file in After Effects, After Effects does not embed all of your Photoshop documents into your After Effects file. It just points to them. It says it's over here. It knows where it is and it keeps referring to it. So if you move your Photoshop file or if you move your After Effects file but not your Photoshop files, then it won't know where to find the Photoshop files and your images will no longer show up in your After Effects file. If you travel to another computer with just your After Effects file but not your Photoshop files, for instance, you'll have a blank document. You'll have all of your editing and animating decisions, but no pictures at all. So avoid that happening to you. Make a new folder, put all of your Photoshop puppets and pieces for animation in that folder before you import them into After Effects. If you import them into After Effects from someplace else and then move them into your folder, then After Effects may not know where to find them. Do it first. Have everything in your folder, save your After Effects document into your folder as well, and then just back up that whole folder. Drag that folder onto your flash drive, and then put the flash drive in another computer, drag the folder back onto the desktop of that computer, and keep working. Your whole folder travels with you. Does that make sense? It's very, very important. So let's open up After Effects. AE. Hit OK to that. And go to File, New, New Project. Save is grayed out because we haven't done anything. So let's do Save As just so we can name it. I'm going to name mine Scott Lagan Animation. And it's .aep, After Effects Project, so that's the native format of After Effects. So when you see .aep, you'll know that's the After Effects Project. So where do we save it? We save it to our folder. Remember, we have everything in the folder, so it travels together. Everything in your folder or things will go wrong. So it's on the desktop, and I go to Scott Lagan Animation, the folder that I created, and there's the folder inside it with all the stuff, right? All the Photoshop stuff. So inside Scott Lagan Animation, I save my After Effects project. 
So now I have all of my Photoshop elements that I've created that I'm going to import into the After Effects project in my folder, and I've also saved my document into my folder, my After Effects document. So that travels with you. By the way, don't work from your flash drive. Things will either slow down or crash. You just use your flash drive to back up your folder, your animation folder with all your stuff in it, and then you go to a new computer, put the flash drive in, drag the entire folder, not individual files, not just your After Effects file, but the entire folder onto the desktop of the computer you're working on, work, 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 save, 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 and then at the end, drag your entire folder back into your flash drive. It'll say, do you want to replace the earlier version on your flash drive? You say yes, and then it backs up all the work you did. So always keep everything in your folder, and the entire folder travels with you to whatever computer you're working on. The After Effects Interface. These are your tools. This holds all the files that you import into your project. This is where you view your animation. This is the timeline for your animation. And this is where you put the layers of objects that are in your timeline. The first thing we're going to do is import file, import file. And you'll want to import all of your Photoshop documents that you've created in order to animate them. File, import, file. And you can select more than one file at the same time, but right now I'm just going to select Moving Background Superhero. And this is very important. Don't import as footage. Import as a composition so that you'll have all of your individual layers in your Photoshop document open. And that's okay. So now I have the little composition, but under here, so I can see all of the individual layers, there's only two layers and I've labeled them. One is the background and one is the guy. And you can see that you get a little preview. There's the guy, he's hard to see, and there's the background when I select that layer. Okay, so all of your objects that you are going to work with and potentially animate, you bring them in here. So for instance, if you have eight separate Photoshop documents with multiple layers that you're going to animate in After Effects, then you would import all eight of them into here. Next, before we do anything else, this is also really important, composition, new composition. We're going to make a new composition, which is a new timeline to work in using the right settings for our video. New composition, and we're going to pick HDTV 1080 29.97. HDTV 1080 29.97 for the preset. Okay, so what that does, the HDTV part, 1080, makes it full high definition. So it's 1920 pixels wide and 1080 pixels high. Make sure it says this. The frame rate is 29.97 frames per second. It's an odd amount, but that's just the standard for video, so that's going to be fine for our purposes. And for duration, we want to make sure it's 30 seconds. Okay. So 30 is right here. So it should say 0, semicolon 00, zero semicolon 30, semicolon 00. Okay, so if it says something else, then go ahead and type in the 30. This is frames. Remember 29.97 frames per second. This is seconds. This is minutes. And this is hours. So frames, seconds, minutes, hours. And we want 30 seconds. So it should say 0, semicolon, 0, 0, semicolon, 30 seconds, semicolon, 0, 0 frames. Okay, so now our animation is exactly 30 seconds, which is what we want for this project. Okay, so now we have a 30 second timeline and we're set up for a full high definition video. Now nothing is in our video yet, so let's go ahead and bring something down. Background. And... We can zoom in on the timeline down here. See the big mountain and the little mountain? So we're zooming in, not on the image, but on the timeline, right? So if we zoom in, we can see this is where 10 frames is, 20 frames, and one second, right? Here's two seconds, here's three seconds, here's four seconds. And the more you zoom in, now I've zoomed in fully and you can see every single frame. So sometimes you'll want to zoom way in and see individual frames, and sometimes you'll want to zoom out 
and see the big picture, see the entire timeline. So this is where you zoom in and out, and this is your timeline, and the numbers are also indicated over here. Again, here's seconds, two seconds, and 18 frames. So at two seconds and 18 frames, this is what's happening in your animation. So we're actually going to animate something right now. Exercise one, keyframing position. In this project, we're going to have the guy flying and the background moving behind him as if the camera is keeping the same pace as the figure. So in order to do that, I need to show you how to keyframe position so that position of the background changes over time. And I'm also going to show you how to add effects to layers in After Effects. We're going to blur the background a little bit using an effect to help the figure stand out a little bit more. So first things first, we'll just leave that background layer in without placing the figure yet. And let's click this little arrow here on this background layer, and then we see an arrow next to the word transform. Let's click that arrow as well. And you see these little stopwatches. If you click on the stopwatch, you're adding a key frame. You say, remember this state at this point in time. So it's important to remember where your time indicator is. So this time we're gonna drag it all the way to the left. I'm zoomed all the way out. So I see the whole timeline, and I've gone all the way to the left, and I can look over here to confirm everything is zeros, so I'm at the very first frame of my animation. So what quality do I want to keyframe? What quality do I want to say, remember where this is, this position, in the first frame? I click on the stopwatch next to the word position, and you'll see over here this little diamond, which is the symbol for keyframes. So it'll say, it'll remember this position, it'll remember this layer, the background layer, is right here in this frame. So I don't want it to be where it is right now. I'm going to change it. And as long as I don't move the timeline indicator, that's fine, okay? So I'm positioning it. So the left side here is lined up with the left side of my frame. And I'm positioning it so the top and the bottom are lined up with the top and the bottom of the frame. So now we have keyframed this position. So we say in that first frame, remember this position for this layer. Then we go to another point in time. This time we're gonna go all the way to the end, 29 seconds and 29 frames, okay? So we're at a different point in time and we can change the position now. And once we keyframed this once, and then we move to another point in time and we change the position, then it will automatically add another keyframe. If you're new to After Effects and you're new to keyframe animation, then one of the mistakes that's easy to make is to forget to keyframe the first position, right? If I didn't click on that stopwatch and add a keyframe, and then I move to another point in time and I change the position, it would just change the position. It wouldn't move, it wouldn't animate. Right? So be sure and add a keyframe in the first place, then go to another point in time, and then move it. So what we want to do is drag, 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 and then line up the right edge of your image with the right edge of the document viewer. Okay, so here we have our document, and now the right side of our Photoshop layer is lined up with the right side of the viewing screen on the very last frame. So let me scrub through this just to show you. Now, if you did that right, you created an animation. The background is moving, right? It was here in the first frame, and as we go through it, it's here in the last frame. And notice we haven't switched any tools. Uh, here are all the tools in After Effects, and we're just using that arrow tool, the selection tool, to move things around. And this is the tool you'll use the most in After Effects. So you can scrub through it to get an idea of the animation, and you can also just hit the space bar, space bar, to make it start moving. And a lot of times it'll move a little slower than it's really moving, although now it's not. If, if your computer is lacking process power, it'll move a little slower, 
and it'll let you know that it is moving slower and it'll take a while to render and, and catch up. If you let it loop a couple times, uh, then it will, uh, will catch up. So I stopped it by hitting the spacebar again. So now let's go back to the first frame again. So now we're going to bring down the layer that says Guy. So it's inside that folder, Background and Guy. So I'm bringing down that layer so it is on top of the other layer. So you'll see a little black line get thicker and a plus and you let go and there's my Guy. So if you can't see the Guy, that means you accidentally dragged it behind the background layer. Just make sure it's on top. Whatever is on top is what you see in front, just like in Photoshop. So now with the Guy layer selected, then all the stuff we do is with the guy. So uh, you can also open this arrow if you wanted to for transform, but for him, we're just gonna leave him in a single position. We're not gonna keyframe him at all. So I'm gonna have him flying, right? I'll just uh, position him kind of in the middle like this. He's not gonna be moving. The background is gonna be moving in our simple exercise. So the last thing we wanna do is we wanna blur the background so he stands out a little bit better. So to add effects, you have to select the right layer to add the effect to. You have to select it to affect it, okay? So here, select the background layer down here in the timeline. Background layer is selected. I'll close the other guy layer just to make more room. Okay, so we have the background layer selected, and we go to Effect, Blur, and Sharpen. This is where all the effects are. Gaussian Blur. Okay, so now we can control it here and I'm pulling to the right. I'm clicking and holding this number and pulling to the right. You can also type in a number if you wanted to. But I'm going to blur it pretty much. And do you see what a difference that makes in being able to see the figure a little bit more clearly? You could also add an effect like color correction and make it a little darker, right? So let's go to Levels. And then on levels, this slider works the same as it does in Photoshop. And I'm going to move this arrow in the mid-range and make it a little bit darker as well. But I'm going to limit the total amount of dark over here. So I'm limiting the contrast and again making him stand out a little bit more. Okay. So here, if you click on the word FX over here, in the effect controls, then you can see the difference. This is what it is before, and this is what it is with the effects applied. So we've applied Gaussian blur and levels and basically taken out contrast and made the whole thing darker but less contrasty. Okay, so now we're ready to play our animation. Okay, and he's slowly flying across the background. So how would you make the background faster? We could grab this keyframe and just move it to a quicker time. Like I'm moving it down to about eight seconds, right? So now the background will move much faster. And of course, since we have a 30 second uh, assignment, then you just need to make your background much longer than this in order to make it fast and last for 30 seconds. But let's just look at it over a course of eight seconds. See, so the background's going by faster, and that looks a lot better, right? But it's going to run out after eight seconds. So you need enough background to make it work. So one more thing. Now we have our background stopping at eight seconds. So we're going to animate our guy so he flies off the screen. So at this point, the background stops. So it's as if the camera stops right here, too. So let's close the background layer so we're not confused. And let's select and open the guy layer. Okay. So when we're at eight seconds, we want him to have stayed the same position all the way up to eight seconds. And then when the background stops moving, he's going to start moving and fly off the frame. Okay. So we want to keyframe the position at exactly eight seconds. So we want to say, yes, he's right here at this point in time. 
right? And since there's no earlier keyframe, he won't move between 0 seconds and 8 seconds. So we want him to zoom off pretty quickly. So let's see, maybe just one second, maybe even a fraction of a second. So I'm moving down and I can see like it's nine seconds in one frame, that's fine, right? So I'm right here. And I'm gonna grab him and I'm gonna move him off the frame. And by the way, right here where it says 78%, that's what you're seeing. So normally it'll be on fit, so it'll, it'll fit to the screen and it'll show you as big as it can in the little viewer here, right? But we can zoom out, I can do 25% and I can see it little. So that way I can see outside of the frame. And in this case, that's pretty useful because what I'm gonna to wanna to do at nine seconds, I'm gonna grab him and I'm gonna move him right off the frame, okay? Just a little bit off the frame till his feet disappear. Now I'll go back to fit. So when the background stops moving, it's as if the camera stops moving too and he just flies right outside of the frame. Okay, so let's look at that full eight seconds. Fly, fly, fly. And at this point at eight seconds, right? So we've done two keyframes for position, one for the guy, and one for the background layer. Now, one other thing, we are seeing the effects control panel up here because we applied an effect to the background layer. We applied two effects, right? But if you wanna see the uh, files that you want to place in your document that you've imported, then you just go to this arrow here and you hit project. And then you see all of your files with all your individual layers. So you can get back to that by accessing it through this arrow, right? Then if you wanna look at the effects that you have on any particular layer, you can go to the arrow and hit effects controls instead. So there's more than one tab on each of these things, right? Exercise two, key framing scale. In our previous project, we keyframed position. We keyframed the position in one frame, then we changed the position and keyframed the position in a different place in a second point in the timeline. But you can keyframe other things besides just position. And in this one, we're going to keyframe scale as well. So open up After Effects, do File, New, New Project, and then do Composition, New Composition. So just because you made a new project doesn't mean you made a composition to work in. So you don't want to skip the step do File, New, and then do Composition, New Composition. And I'll call this one, Use This One, so there's no confusion. And if you made another document at the right resolution and size and format, then it should already be on those settings. But you want HD TV 1080p 2997 frames per second, okay? So make sure it's on that, 1920, 1080. 29.97 is the frame rate. And for duration, let's select the duration and make it just three seconds. Okay. So it should be zero, semicolon, zero, zero, semicolon, zero, three seconds, and then semicolon, zero, zero frames. And hit OK. So we made a new composition. And in the future, you can make projects that have multiple compositions, each with their own individual timeline. So we've set it up, so we have a composition, and it's three seconds long. So we're going to import file, and we're going to import ball and background from our online animation exercise files, and we're going to select import as composition to make sure it has all of the individual layers, and we hit open. Okay. And now we have a folder that has the two layers in that document. So we drag background layer, we select that one and drag that down. And there's our background layer, which is exactly the size of our high definition video document. Then we drag the ball layer so that it's on top of the background. Okay. If you don't see it, it means you accidentally dragged it 
behind the background layer. If it's behind the background layer, you can't see it. Whatever's on top, I'm dragging it back on top, is in the front. Make sure your timeline indicator is all the way to the left, and it's all zeros over here, so it's the very first frame. So click the arrow next to the ball layer, then click the word transform to open that up. And in the previous project, we clicked position, and let's go ahead and do that here too, because we might wanna change the position as the ball scales up and appears to come towards us, okay? Click stopwatch for position, but we can click and make a keyframe for more than one quality. So we're gonna click on the stopwatch next to the word scale as well. Click, okay? So now in this first frame, we're at, we've keyframed position and scale, okay? So now let's take scale and make it almost invisible, it's so small, okay? I'm gonna, and maybe I don't even need to change the position yet. I'll just make the position, the, the uh, I have the scale at 1% here, and, and that's in the middle, that looks pretty good, it's coming from here. So now I'm going to go to the end of the composition, so it'll take three seconds for the ball to come towards us. So now I'm gonna change the scale, and then I'll see if I need to change the position, and I, I kinda do. Okay, so now it's coming right here in our face until it, it goes across the entire document. Okay, and uh, that's 300%, 307% scale at that point. Now, remember you can view over here where this number is, it says fit, makes it as big as possible in the screen, but I'm gonna zoom out, I'm gonna choose 25% again, so it's a little tiny, and I'm gonna position this maybe so the, uh, changing the position, and I'll, I'll look and see if I, I like what happened. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's coming out right in the middle. Yeah. I'm going to move it a little bit. So notice we have diamonds for position and scale in the first frame, and diamonds for position and scale in the last frame. So in order to view this, I'll go back to fit so you can see it better. So it's coming right at us. Okay, it's looping over and over again so you can see it. Now we're done with this exercise, but don't close this project. To close a project in After Effects, you'd go to File, Close Project. But don't do that, because in the next exercise, we're just gonna add a new composition and use the same ball and background to animate. Exercise three, changing a motion path. So for this exercise, we're just gonna leave our same project open. If you did already close the previous project with the ball, just do file new project and re-import the ball and background, okay? If you have it open, then you're already there, and all we have to do is make a new composition because projects can have multiple compositions. So composition, new composition, and let's leave this one three seconds HDTV 1080 29.97 and again you can select it if it's not already there but it probably is already there in three seconds for the duration we'll hit OK and we have a brand new composition so now we'll drag the background into this composition and we'll also drag the ball so it's on top and I click the little arrow next to the ball layer and then I click the word transform and now I'm not going to keyframe scale yet. I'm just gonna reduce it in scale, right? So if I don't click the stopwatch first and I just reduce it in scale, I'm not keyframing, I'm just making it a different size. So it's not animating, it's just making it smaller. Now I'm going to move it over here for the beginning of our project and I am going to keyframe position. So I'm making sure my timeline indicator is all the way to the left, so it's all zeros over here. It's in the very first frame of our composition, and I'm keyframing the position. Then I'm moving about 10 frames. Again, you can zoom in if you wanna see, but it's uh, less than half a second, okay? Later in the timeline. And then I'm moving this down to change its position to here. And you can see this path here indicates the path that it's traveling 
in your keyframe animation. It's going in a straight line from here to here over a period of 10 frames, less than half a second. Then we'll move to about 20 frames and we'll move the ball this way, okay? And it's kind of making a continuous curve, which is not what we want at all. I'll move it just outside of here. So what we want to do is change this curved path to a straight path temporarily. So this works exactly like Illustrator, like I showed you in the pen tool in the first semester. So if you click on this tool here, it might show up as the pen tool by default in your tools. Just click and hold, and it's the little thing that says Convert Vertex Tool. It looks like a less than or greater than symbol, okay? So you want to find the little square over here, and as soon as you put the tool over the square, it'll, it'll turn into that symbol. So you know that you have the right one, right? We don't want to add a dot. Go over here to the larger square so it turns into that symbol and go click. And we've changed it into two straight paths. And the reason we want to do that is we want to now click on the arrow tool, the selection tool, the very first tool. Works just like it does in Photoshop. And you'll see there's a big dot here, right? So that's a place to grab onto. And you get those bezier handles. And I'm pulling a curve so now my ball is bouncing in a little arc like it would, right? Then I'm going over here to this curve and I'm pulling this. So I'm changing the path. I'm not changing the time frame I'm, and I'm not changing the end point and the beginning point, but I'm changing the path into an arc, right? And I'm grabbing these little bezier handles that are like crowbars, just like an illustrator. I can pull and change my arc, okay? So just to show you what we've got so far, now the ball is bouncing in a more natural way. It's arcing down and bouncing and arcing back up. Okay, so we changed the shape of the path. Okay, so you can change a curve to a straight path by using this convert vertex tool. And I went click, I changed it to a straight path, and then I grabbed it and I pulled it into two separate curves going in the right direction. Okay, and there's one other thing we're going to do. We're going to change scale, but not in the way that we did in the last project. We don't need to have scale keyframed in the first frame, but what we want to do is we want to change the proportion so it squishes a little when it hits the ground, when it bounces, right? So we're going to go to right before it hits, because we're going to want it to maintain its roundness right before it hits, right? So we're going to keyframe scale right before it hits. Okay, so I have it at nine frames and then at the 10th frame it bounces, right? So I'm gonna go not to the 10th frame where it hits yet, but I'm gonna go to the 11th frame where it's bouncing back up again because I also want it to not be squished there. As it's going back up, it's going back to its regular round frame, right? So I'm not changing the scale here but what I want to do is select the scale and make another keyframe where it's going to be the same there too. Okay, so you can select position, select scale, select rotation. I'm selecting scale. Okay, and then I'm going to animation, add scale keyframe. If I selected position, it would say add position keyframe. But we're choosing add scale keyframe. Click, and then it adds new keyframe in exactly the same position. So why are we doing that? Because we're going to go right between, right at the point where it hits. And again, you can zoom in if you're uncertain, if you're in the right place. And we want it to squish. So in order to squish, we have to uncheck that little chain. The chain would keep it proportional. So if we change the width, it also changes the height, right? So it's not squished or stretched. But we actually want it to squish a little bit. So I'm taking that off. And I'm going to the second number. And I'm pulling to the left so it squishes a little bit. Okay, so I have this number at 29% for scale. Okay, and I have this number at 22%. Okay, so here it is at, at, at a proportional round shape. And then as it hits, it squishes, and then it goes back up to its round shape again. So this is what it looks like. Squish, bounce. So we've created an arc, and we've made it squish right as it hits like you'd expect a ball to, right? So here it is, boing. And if you thought the squish was too, uh, too hard to see, you could pull it back. You could grab that keyframe and pull it back 
so that they're each one more keyframe apart. So each one has two frames. Boing. That actually looks pretty good. Exercise four, puppet animation. So in this project, we're going to import a multi-layered puppet as well as a background, and we're going to animate the limbs of the puppet separately. So the first thing we want to do, file, new, new project, and then we'll do composition, new composition, and again, make sure it's HDTV 1080, 29.97, 1920, 1080 pixels, 29.97 frames, and let's make the duration just three seconds again. Okay, so zero, 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 three, and zero, zero frames. Hit OK. So now we have a three second composition. Now, file, import, file, and in our online animation exercise files, we want Monster Puppet Simplified, import as composition, OK, and then file, import, file, and pick HD background for animation. And this time we can just leave it as footage. It's only a single layer, so it wouldn't matter either way. But making it footage just makes it a flat layer. Open. So there it is. OK, so I'm going to drag down the background. There it is. And I'm going to open up the folder next to the monster. And you can see that they're labeled head, left arm, left leg. And if you click, it shows you what it is up here. It gives you a little preview, right? So let's drag the torso down first and make sure it's on top of the background layer. So it says background and then torso. Here's our little body. And this is going to stay still for now. We're going to make the arms and legs flail and the head go back and forth. And then we're going to move the whole thing around. So let's start with the left arm. I'm picking the left arm layer. I can see it's the left arm. And I'm dragging it down so it's on top of the background layer, but underneath the torso. Right? So I'll grab it and show you. See, so it's underneath the torso. So I'm moving it into the right position here. Okay, to start rotating. Now there's an important thing you have to remember in order to do this right. And I'll show you, I'll show you the wrong thing. So I have the left arm selected and I'm opening it up. You should open this up too. Then open up the triangle next to transform so you can see all this stuff. And here's rotation right under position and scale that we've already worked with. So under rotation, select. Now to rotate an object, you don't want uh, to mess with the zero X. If you did one time, it means it rotates a whole 360 degrees all the way around once. If you did this 28 times, it would spin around like a propeller. So you don't want to mess with that. It's this one, one afterwards. It says plus zero percent. But if you were to try to rotate this, you go to the second number here and I'm clicking and pulling to the right and it rotates in a funny way, right? It rotates right off the body. So why is that? It's because the axis of rotation is over here based on the center of the Photoshop document. And that's not what you want, right? We want the axis of rotation for each of these individual layers to be in the right place. So for this, it's about where the shoulder would be, about right here, right? So we gotta move this over here. So to do that, you need to select another tool. And the tool is the pan behind tool. If you put your mouse over it, pan behind tool. It's right between the shape tool and the, uh, the camera here. So go to that pan behind tool and select it. Okay, and then grab that axis of rotation and move it to where it should be, right here on the shoulder. Okay, so that's the first thing. You gotta remember to select the pan behind tool and move the axis of rotation to the right place for each of your limbs. Then you gotta remember not to try to do anything else until you go back to your arrow, right? Because you don't want the pan behind tool anymore. You want the arrow to start moving stuff. So now we keyframe rotation, click. We're in the very first frame, so make sure your timeline indicator is all the way to the left and keyframe rotation. And we can just start any place. We'll start down here. Then I'll move to 10 frames. It's a little less than half a second. And move it up. And then we can move it back down. I'm pulling to the left on rotation. Then I'm moving another 10 seconds about. 
and I don't need to be exact and I don't need to copy the numbers over here because he's flailing, right? So I want the things to be different, the uh, amount of rotation each time. Maybe I'll make a shorter time and have him flail just a little bit more. So this is for exercise purposes, but again, you would want your project to be a lot more purposeful and elaborate in its techniques. I just want to show you something really simple so you get the idea of all the basics. Okay, so now if we were to scrub through, we can see the little flailing, and I'll hit the space bar, hit, so you can see everything flailing in real time. So we got one limb flailing, right? So now we're going to do that with all the other limbs. Now we're ready to bring in the head. And I'm putting that on the very top, so it's in front of the torso. And I'm bringing it down, and I'm changing the axis of rotation to be about where the nose is. Okay, and I'm bringing the timeline indicator to the very front, opening it up, transform, rotation, Okay, so now I have him wiggling around. I'll play it, him hitting the space bar. So here he is, wiggling vigorously. It's looping. But, wouldn't it be nice if we could move him around at the same time, instead of having him just standing there flailing? So now we want to make him move all around, but we want to keep his limbs attached to his body, right? So if I change the position of the body right now by selecting that and keyframing position in different frames, the body would move all around, but the arms and the legs and the head would stay where they are. So is there an easy way to keep everything together and keep the same motion, but have the whole object be moving around in different places? So the way you do that is parenting an object. You see this little squiggly symbol here under the word parent? All you have to do, and we'll want to make the torso the parent so that everything else moves with that object. So we're going to connect every other layer to the torso layer. So if I click and hold on that little squiggle on the head layer, and look, I'm stretching it out and I'm pointing to the torso. So now the head is attached to the torso. Right? And it says right there, it's parented to the torso layer. So again, right leg to the torso, right? And then this one to the torso, this one to the torso, this one to the torso. But I'm not pointing the torso layer with the very bottom layer, the background layer, because we don't want the background to move with the figure, just all of the limbs and the head. So that one should say none. And the torso layer should say none, because it's the parent, right? So now I select the torso layer. I drag the timeline indicator so it's all the way to the zeros, the very beginning. Open that up. Open transform if it's not open already. And keyframe position, okay? And I'll put him over here. And then I'll move him at 10 frames over here and maybe I'll make his movement in an arc 
right? So I'll go to 20, and I'll move him over here. Then I'll move it over here. I'll move him down, and I'll move him here. And I'll move him up, I'll move him down here. I'll make him kind of retrace his steps a little bit, and I'll make an arc. Then I'm moving here, and having him move here, change his arc a little, move over here. Okay, so anyway, let's make him zoom right off the page. So it, here we go. Okay, so he's moving around, he's flailing, and he's zooming off the page. Exercise five, puppet pin tool, frame by frame. So in this exercise, I'm going to show you how to use the puppet pin tool, which is this thing that looks like a push pin here. So let's go file, new project, and we remember to make a new composition for our project. Let's make it HDTV 1920 1080, and let's just make it three seconds again, and hit OK. Now go to File, Import, File, and let's do Scott Pin Puppet and Import as a Composition, and hit Open. Open up the folder, and we'll drag Pin Puppet Scott down. And you can see that the file is large, has too many pixels. So what we're going to do is reduce it so we can see the whole thing. And we're not going to keyframe scale. We're just going to go to scale and reduce the size so we can see the whole person here. And I'm also going to go to rotation and rotate it slightly so it's more like that. Okay, and I haven't keyframed anything. And of course we could give him a background or combine him with lots of other stuff. And of course you can combine what I'm about to show you with the pin puppet tool, with the traditional puppet animation and all kinds of other stuff. So you can have multiple layers with lots going on and you probably will in your finished 30 second project. Keyframing from one good composition to another. So with this tool, and we want the first one, the puppet pin tool, and we want to apply pins every place that we're going to move the object, so kind of like on the, the joints. So hand, elbow, shoulder, other shoulder, elbow. I'm going to undo and make that one a little better. Elbow, hand, maybe neck and top of head, and torso, and I'm just going to do foot. I'm not going to do the knee because the legs are pretty short in the perspective and I just want to be able to move the whole leg around. If that doesn't work, you can start over. You can undo and add some more pins if you want. So the puppet pin tool automatically adds some keyframes uh, for, to your positions. So all you have to do is you can move to another point in time and move certain objects. Do you see that? And it's really easy to make it look kind of bent and crazy. So try not to do that too much. Um, I'll go ahead and make it a little crazy. And uh, basically I'm not going to move the legs at all. I'm just going to move the torso. So. Uh, your professor is, is shimmying, I'm moving to another point in time, changing that, changing this, and I could add another pin if I didn't want it to look too funny. Okay, now I'm going to the next point, and shimmy back. And up, and up. And other way, not that much. Make the 
head move this time. But anyway, here's a little movement, right? So um, we have the, uh, it, first it'll be in slow motion, but it'll loop. And you can see the, uh, the crazy movement. So don't use this as a shortcut for animating things more accurately, having images with separate layers and separate animations, but sometimes this can be effective. And again, you know, it's all about the purpose and what works with your composition. Exercise six, puppet pin tool, real time. You can also use the Puppet Pin tool to record animation in real time. So for this, we'll go to File, New, New Project, Composition, New Composition, 1920, 1080, yada, yada, three seconds, hit OK, File, Import, File, Scott Pin Puppet, Input as Composition, hit OK, open up the folder, drag layer one, which is the only layer, we see Scott, and we will open up Transform, scale it down so we can see it, rotate it a little bit. Again, they're not keyframed, right? Just We just change the scale and change the rotation. So now I'm selecting the Starch tool, the Puppet Starch tool, and I'm clicking here, and here, and here, and here, so nothing distorts in the areas that I'm selecting. So you can keep those areas from distorting by clicking on the starch, right? So now I'll go to the Puppet Pin tool and I'll go to here, 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 and here. Okay, now I have my tool over, over the uh, belly button uh, pin right here. And if I hold down the Command key, which I'm about to in a second, it'll start recording in real time. So I'm pressing the command key now. So you got a stopwatch and I'm wiggling him around and the legs are moving back and forth instead of distorting, okay? So now if I play that back and it'll take a little while to render so it's moving at full speed, you'll see the legs are waving around instead of distorting and the arms too. So you can keep things from getting too weird by starching and preventing those areas from distorting. So that's recording some motion in real time. So you can combine all of these methods, right? You could use some puppet pins to move things in a simple fashion, either in real time or frame by frame. And you can combine that with multi-layered puppets, backgrounds, all kinds of stuff. Exporting a QuickTime movie in After Effects. Okay, so now we're going to export our After Effects project as a QuickTime video in a format that can be opened and worked with in GarageBand. First we go to Composition, Add to Render Queue, and then we see the, uh, the Render Queue down here. First click on Lossless, and then on Format Options, and instead of Animation, choose Apple ProRes 422. Then you hit OK, and then OK again. And then you click Output 2, and you click on the blue words next to it. And let's call it something that lets us know that it's the video without sound rather than the finished video with sound. So I'll call mine Scott Lagan No Sound. And I want to be aware of where I save it to. I'm going to save it to my desktop. Now I'll hit save. And then there's one more step. We actually have to render the video by hitting render. And then it's done. And I should be able to find my QuickTime video called Scott Lagan No Sound on the desktop. Okay, and one more step, hide After Effects. We'll want to look at our video just to make sure it came out okay. Animation no sound, 
and I'll drag it to QuickTime to take a look at the video, right? So that came out okay. Now I'm ready to import this video, Scott Lagan Animation No Sound dot move, MOV is the QuickTime format. I'm ready to import that into Apple GarageBand and add sound and then export a new movie with sound. And that's what you'll hand in to me. Now on to our next video about adding music and effects to your animation using Apple GarageBand.